Howdy, it's a new day, and I've done just a few things before I quit for the day yesterday, and that is I uh, Loctited this uh, crank on. I put a flat on the crankshaft for the flywheel and a little bit of a flat right here. And again, this will be held on with a set screw. Now what I've done here, if you can follow this, you can see where the set screw is there. So that's going to go on in that position. Now notice that that is not 90 degrees or 180 degrees in relationship to the other side. It's perhaps 170 degrees and the reason for that is I'm attempting to make the engine self-starting because even with a two-cylinder engine and both the cylinders double acting there are dead spots and it probably will not start when it's dead center so this will put one of the cylinders I hope or one of the pistons in a position where it will self start I'm not sure I got the geometry right, right. I might have to change that but I'm attempting to make a self starting engine now I'm turning my attention to the cylinders and there's the material this is a uh, three-quarter square brass and there's only enough there to get one cylinder and I showed you this earlier this has already been been reduced to uh, three-quarter and one inch this way and I had to solder that now that'll be cut off to the right length as will this and I'm not going to show you all those steps just a few little different things as I go along that might vary from what I showed you in earlier videos and just for a little variety I'm going to bore or ream the cylinders, the main bore, on the lathe this time, rather than the milling machine. So on with the show. I've milled the end of this piece square, so now I can mark both of them as far as the length is concerned, and that's to be one and three eighths long. And I'll rough saw them, and then mill them down to the line, to the final length. You can see that's going to be waste stock on the end there. And on this one, there was almost enough to make two if, if I didn't have a kerf to worry about. But the bottom one here that's been milled, not sawed, will be the other one. And then I've already laid out the three-quarter line because it's going to be three-quarter thick. That way it'll be the same thickness as this one. So I got some sawing and some milling to do, and I'll do that off camera. Okay, they're down to the right thickness, but they're not the right length now. But notice that sometimes, even when you've got uh, two pieces that are the same size stock, in this case one inch, I got the vise tightened quite tight, but one is held uh, firmly and one is not, so be careful that they're both held firmly that you don't start milling and then uh, real, then when the cutter hits us it breaks the cutter or throws the work or something like that because you just can't assume they're the same some people use a piece of packing in there like maybe some uh, a donut carton or something but I don't like that they gotta be held uh, uh, securely so rather than being being able to do two at a time I'll do one at a time so I'll take it down to the line and then without changing my setting, just put the other piece in there and they'll be the same height. Not that that is all that critical, but that's the way I like to work. Both of these are exactly the same height now. And I'm laying them out 3 8 by 3 8 Can you see how there's tiny shavings produced by this carbide scraper? And then I'm center punching both of them right on the target. And we're ready to go over to the Logan lathe where we're going to drill and ream them. One half inch. Five hundred thousandths. The cylinder is roughly mounted in a four jaw chuck. And what you can do uh, to center that is I brought the center up to it. And I've got it approximately in the right spot, just according to the ball bearing center here. And that may be good enough. 
if you have a good eye and got plenty of light and got your magnifier and everything. But let me show you a better way of doing it. This is a Sterrett center finder and you've seen this in one of my other videos and I just gave a demonstration on it but here's a, a practical use for it. Uh, not just a, a demo where I'm showing you how to set it up but we got a rod here mounted in gimbals and a tool holder here that can be held in the tool post and a sharp point on one end and a sharp point on the other end and all we're going to do is put the sharp point in there and uh, this in the tool holder and as I rotate the chuck by hand any error will be greatly amplified by the far end here and then I can adjust the four jaw chuck until I get it just where I want it. So let me set that up and get right back to you. Brown and Sharp makes one of these too. It's pretty similar in design but notice there's a spring right here and as I advance the carriage just a little bit can you see the spring flexing and I want it flex just enough to hold that point into the center punch mark as such. Also I can raise it up and down a little bit here with this screw with this knurled knob here so that I get it pretty well on center and then as I rotate this you know we got about an inch and a half there and we got about eight inches or more here and that amplifies the error. So now if you look at the dead center here as I rotate this you'll see this wobble and I want to move the uh, jaws and the four jaw chuck and adjust it until the wobble pretty much disappears. Does this make any sense to you at all? Any sense at all? But when there is no wobble here, then I'm pretty darn close to having the center punch mark here on the true center. Now, it was pretty close just by the initial method there that I showed you a, a minute or two early. Uh, and I did that just with the, with the center. And I haven't changed it since then, but that's how close I was. But it's not close enough for my liking. When you do your initial uh, moving around here, you don't want the jaws too tight because you'll scuff the heck out of that soft brass shifting it around in the fixed jaws. But notice that I use a couple knobs here as chuck keys and I've seen shown those in other videos. So that's what I use so I can work one against the other. Then I will rotate it and as I'm doing that I will watch the, uh, the pointer on the dead center down there. Then I'll rotate it 90 degrees and do a similar thing. Back and forth, back and forth until I get it exactly where I want. And then when I do get it where I want, then I'll go back in for the kill with my regular uh, chuck key to tighten it up. But I will very careful and work my way around. Just a little bit of pressure, a little bit of pressure, and all the way around until I get it tight. Then I will double check it again to make sure that I have not taken it uh, off of my setting. If you haven't done it before it might seem a little laborious but it really goes pretty fast and these were commonly used before the days of indicators. Every machinist had one. Now it is archaic. I am in full realization that I beat a subject to death but let me show you here before I make the final setting I'm going to manipulate just these two knobs. I'm not going to rotate the spindle at all. But watch what happens here on the dead center. I will endeavor to move in a little bit as I just move those back and forth. You see what's happening. You see that? I'm not rotating the spindle or the chuck at all. I'm just moving one jaw against the other. So it's, it's really simple to get this right on center actually a great method. I wish it was uh, more widely used. But it's archaic. But then again, so is Tubal Cain. And there it is. Virtually no wobble. I'm ready to drill and ream. And there are my tools laid out. A center drill, a quarter inch, 31 64 and my half inch reamer. 
I have already center drilled to establish the hole, and this is a quarter inch, just a pilot. And uh, this is either a mighty sharp drill or mighty soft brass, but it sure is really nice. And probably don't even need any uh, lubricant here, but I will on the reamer. So I'm going to drill all the way through. Now the 3164, so that is 164 under half inch. And now the half inch chucking reamer, and I've slowed the machine down to whatever, but I'm in back years. I don't know the RPM off them, but it's just about right for reaming. And I'll ream all the way through. There is the remote possibility of some of you making this a headless engine, that is, uh, drilling and boring and, and reaming a blind hole. Now there are those that believe that a hole should be quite a bit of force on it. I'm going to back it out and clear the chips. There are those that believe that uh, after you drill, you want to uh, bore it and then ream it. And I sometimes do that, but this project is not all that critical, so I'm just doing a straight drill and ream. But boring would bring the hole back into true concentricity if your drill had drifted a little bit. Boy, did I have trouble reaming that hole. The... Uh, Reamer wanted to spin in the chuck, and the chuck wanted to spin in the tailstock, so I gave up. This was the reamer I was using. You can see it's a silvery one, so I, I got a black one. It's a black in color, oxide. Uh, brand new, never been used, but the difference between the two was remarkable, and I do not consider this to be a dull reamer, but that only confirms what I've told you er much earlier in the video about using super keen tools on brass. So now I took my own advice, and uh, what a difference a day makes. 24 little hours. Cylinder 1 is done. Now I loosened only jaws 1 and 2, and I keep my jaws uh, numbered, but if, if I put the other one in there exactly the same, and do not mess with the other two jaws, and the two blanks were exactly the same, and they virtually are, I'll just tighten these two and it should be right on dead center. I'll double check it, but I, I believe it's going to be pretty darn close if not perfect and I uh, will drill and ream this other one off camera it took me five minutes to ream with the silvery reamer at which uh, time I gave up about three quarters of the way through and finished off with the black oxide reamer and it took 15 or 20 seconds in all to ream the other piece with with the super sharp brand new reamer so it is, uh, it is no lie. I rather enjoy doing accurate layout work uh, in this manner, but I put center lines on the cylinders like that. And that's three quarters, so halfway is three eighths. And then I want to find the center this way, so I set the height gauge for that. Then I center punch the center, and I'm going to swing my uh, my arc there. It's set for nine sixteenths, and these will be the the steam ports, of course. You know, I was thinking I set this thing with a ruler, like we all do, and it's fairly accurate, accurately as you can work. But back when I was in my prime at the high school, I had a great big brown and sharp vernier calipers and it was quite old but one feature that it had on the back side there were two tiny little uh, divots you know one about there and one about there and you could set your dividers you would set the 
the caliper for whatever you wanted and then you could set your dividers over here put it in one uh, little center punch mark and set it for the other one you could really set them quite accurate now, I wonder if anybody's ever seen one of those or if anybody else makes those, but that was a nice feature other than I don't like reading a vernier and you know some people still call these a vernier, a dial caliper a vernier, but vernier is a vernier scale and it invented by a, a man I believe by the name of Vernier and you, you know where you Frenchman. Okay, then I'll, I'm going to quit for the day. I've had quite enough excitement and I'm going to uh, drill these holes like I did earlier in the video a long long time ago and I sometimes forget what I all did earlier in the video because that's a, a whole week ago but I will drill and tap the center one as shown and then uh, drill the two steam ports in both of them with the same setup and it really speeds things up when you're doing two or more. See you on the morrow.